Hi class, uh, now we're going to talk about probably the most well-known developmental psychologist. His name was Jean Piaget. He was pretty opportunistic, if I do say so myself. He got to stay at home with his kids and study his kids the whole time he was doing his research. He just stayed with his children and watched them and wrote about how he thought children developed. Pretty awesome gig, if you can get it. He also talked about several things that are important to understand. Schema, assimilation, and accommodation. Assimilation is like you learn something new and you log it into your schema. Schema is your concept or your general idea of things. You might think of the book describes toy as a schema, right? That at first a toy might be a ball or a doll or, you know, some sort of um, like toy guns. You know, my kids have all these Nerf guns. But then as you get older, you're going you're gonna to assimilate more and more things into your idea of toy and also you have to accommodate that some people say well my you know I just I bought a new drill that's my new toy so our concepts of things in thinking have to assimilate and accommodate stuff new things that we learn into our schemas of what things are <clears throat> alright so Piaget came up with uh, really cool ideas about how children develop he said that first their idea is that they're in this sensory motor stage where they're learning basically everything through touching and moving. This is why there are a lot of um, programs like uh, Montessori, Waldorf that have a lot to do with really sensory inputs and manipulatives have been incorporated more and more into early uh, childhood education programs. That you really are trying to overcome this issue with object permanence. So, for example, uh, I've got a hat on. If you're a baby, there's no more hat. The hat has disappeared from the world's existence, is no longer relevant. You know that's true because, well, whenever their mom leaves, they freak out in the sensory motor stage. But when mom comes back into the world, everything's glorious. Everything's wonderful, right? So, my hat's back. Bam. Everything's cool. All right, so that's the sensory motor stage. When kids get out of that stage, which is around two years old, this is really with uh, language is happening, but Piaget didn't talk about language. He was talking about cognitive development. Object permanence is that you can play games with babies where you'll have, you know, like a shell game where you had cups in a shell, and if they have an interested thing, you know, interested toy in front of them, you put a cup over it that covers it, that thing's gone. They're like, well, that thing's gone. On to the next thing. They don't really freak out about it, but if you if a baby has moved past object permanence into the pre-operational stage, that means that they know you took away their favorite binky, their favorite toy, and they're very upset about it, and they want to go search out and find it. They, however, have what's called egocentrism, so they see the world only from their viewpoint. In fact, that sounds selfish. It's not. In fact, what it is is that they can't see from another's perspective. So, in that sense, Piaget set up a, si a simulation where there was like a, a mountain and snow on the top of the mountain, trees on this side and a village on this side. And then he showed a little girl the side, all sides of it, and he put a little doll here and said, what can that doll see in this scenario? And the girl in the pre-operational stage, she described the trees, the mountain and the village, yet the mountain completely obscured the doll's visual line of sight for the village. So Piaget basically said, look, she can't take that doll's perspective to understand what it would be experiencing. And that's what we call egocentrism in the pre-operational stage. Another thing about pre-operational stage is that they don't understand conservation. This has been one that's been dismissed and, and people have done research on this and it turns out the kids actually do have conservation. But this is the idea that you have a tall glass of water and a short fat glass of water, both that have exactly the same amount of water in them. Uh, and the kids will call the tall glass of water the, um, the one that has more. It's, it's, there's some things about language that compromise that study, but again, they do have problems conserving or you'll take a piece of dough and then you know, two equal pieces of dough and you'll roll one out into like the longer snake, you know, Play-Doh. And then you'll ask the kid which one's bigger, which is kind of a trick question from a linguistic standpoint. So I criticize, I criticize Piaget on that because which one's bigger is a forced choice question of these children. And yet they can't, you don't say, are they the same? 
Are they different? And if they're different, how? Which one's bigger or smaller? That would be a much better way to say it instead of the fourth choice is, is which one's bigger. So that's, that's in the um, pre-operational stage. When kids get to about age seven, they move into what's called the concrete operation stage. And the concrete operation stage is really where you find kids that are learning to do, think about things uh, outside of themselves, to conceptualize the world from others' perspective. This concrete operation stage is where they understand and think more logically, where they will refer to learning, previous learning that they've experienced to give them sort of an understanding in life. Uh, it's really fun to be around these kids, you know, the seven to 12 year olds, the, the pre-teens, they're, they're really fantastic folks and, and they are really interested in investigating the world. So that's one of the things that you'll find a lot of people when they start to work with kids, they find that seven to 12 year old range to be a delightful age. It's before all that teenage stuff starts happening. But Piaget said that what happens is they get really locked in logically and they can't think outside the box. They can't think broader than their own perspectives. Um, rules are rules and there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. it. Them's the rules. And so Piaget said that they're limited in their thinking that way. Once they hit puberty, he said basically they get full adult thinking. Now that's a little bit, a little bit simplistic of the understanding, but Piaget, like Freud, stopped at puberty and said, oh, well, once you hit puberty, you're an adult, so there's no more development, right? So these early developmental psychologists had a limited viewpoint. They didn't have a perspective that was uh, lifelong. It wasn't until Eric Erickson came around that we, under that, that we began to take into account the developmental changes that occur throughout one's life rather than just in the first you know, 14, 15 years of somebody's life. But Formal operations, again, that's from anywhere from 11 on up to adulthood. That's where children can think logically and rationally and systematically, but they're capable of abstract thought, right? This is also when kids start to get into algebra um, and they, they are capable of doing that. Now, obviously, if you're a good math teacher for kids that are younger than that, you're, you're, building the, you're laying down the building blocks uh, for that, for, for abstract mathematical thinking, but they really don't get it, uh, variable notation and the like, until they're at about the age 11 or 12 years old. They really don't understand that. So that's Piaget's theory about cognitive development in a stage. It's simplistic, but it also was the most famous one and it got us thinking about how people develop over time. All right, next thing we'll talk about in development is something called temperament. This is the basis of personality. When we talk about temperament, it's sort of one's general um, attitude towards the world, um, whether it be jovial, happy, sad, shy, sort of the, the key characteristic of a personality that describes a kid. And I don't really buy into the temperament stuff about kids because, well, so much has to do with the context in which they're born. I don't think it's some sort of immutable characteristic about them. Uh, let's say like their sex, right? That's genetically determined at conception. But this temperament stuff, whether they're uh, you know high strung, easily soothed, whether they're you know interactive or, or despondent, you know, all that stuff, I'm not really sure that that has much to do with outcomes later in life. There's not great research on it. I will say this from a, a gender standpoint, turns out little girls are more agreeable and less um, cry y they, they cry less, they're less disturbed as infants than little boys. Little boys tend to be um, more agitated easily. So that's not just because I had three boys. Uh, all three boys, had they had variability in my, in my experience of difference in their temperament. But uh, when researchers look into temperament for children, they say little boys tend to have uh, more disagreeable sort of um, behaviors like crying and neediness and all that stuff. All right. Um, that leads us to this idea of attachment style. Attachment style is basically from Mary Ainsworth and John Bowlby's work where uh, Bowlby was really looking at um, a whole host of things, but Mary Ainsworth specifically went into the lab and took caregivers, mothers that is, and their children and basically put them through what's called the strange situation. And in that she assessed the child's attachment or their interpersonal connectivity to their caregiver. This is um, a really cool thing because each of us has an, uh, our own unique connection to our mom, right? Everybody has the concept of mom, that's Jungian archetype of the mother, but 
each of us has our own individual mom and whether she was there a lot, a little, too much, too little, we all have a relationship with her and that developed from a very young age until now. And the attachment style that Mary Ainsworth described was uh, she had different types of attachment. There was um, secure attachment, ambivalent, anxious, and uh, disorganized. And these different attachment styles lead to growing up and having relationships that are reflective of these styles of attaching to another person. So that's kind of cool stuff. You should read about attachment styles and touch, especially about Harry Harlow and the monkeys. Uh, amazingly, remember how much I was talking about touch in the last video? Amazingly, touch is an imperative connectivity to another person. And in fact, these baby rhesus monkeys that Harry Harlow was studying, he gave them sort of a forced choice. He said, all right, so here's one wire mesh monkey where this little poor baby would hold on to the monkey and it could nurse, it could get bottle fed, right? could get food, sustenance, it had to get that. But then on the other side of our partition is this warm terry cloth mother, this mother that feels soft and is warmed up with a light bulb and has eyes that, I mean, they're, they're not real eyes, they're this sort of a fake plastic thing, but that actually looked more like a rhesus mother than the wire mesh mother that had the bottle. These rhesus monkeys, these babies spent nearly all of their time with the warm, soft mother. They wanted that touch, they wanted that caress yeah, of course they needed the milk, but they didn't hang out and bond and attach to that sort of wire mesh thing. They went to the to the smooth thing. That makes perfect sense. That was Harry Harlow's work on um, connectivity, connection, attachment to our caregivers. Um, okay, now we get to my favorite developmental psychologist, who is Eric Erickson. Why I like him so much is he studied the entire life. He didn't just study kids up until they turn teenagers and now we call them adults. He studied the whole life and he said that at each stage we have sort of an obstacle to overcome and that if we don't overcome that obstacle we kind of get stuck in our personal inner inter, intra personal development that if we don't overcome this idea it's going to affect the rest of everything we do almost like we're marching up this sort of stages of development. First, he starts off with trust versus mistrust. Now, this is a perfect one for babies because when they cry in this big, scary world that their little brains are trying to take in, are they comforted? Are they touched? Are they soothed? If, if they are, then they figure out, hey, I can trust this world. This world's full of helpers, you know, like Mr. Rogers says. Look for the helpers. Well, some babies don't have that experience. <clears throat> Sadly, they, they learn mistrust that people can't be relied upon. Sometimes they hurt them or neglect them. And then they develop a sense of mistrust throughout those, those, uh, the rest of their years for people. Uh, and that's from like zero to a year. Then he said that kids kind of go through this little Freudian thing, which is like potty training issue, autonomy versus doubt. I'm not a big fan of that stage. The next one is three to six, where it's like they've kind of gone through that potty training thing Autonomy, can they potty train on their own? Doubt, you know, they kind of think about themselves as, ah, I, can't, I can't learn to go poop on the potty. But then the next one, which is initiative versus guilt, is sort of understanding the efficacy of that child in the world to do good things or bad things, right? Are they initiative? I'm gonna go help mommy set the table, or I'm gonna sneak candy, right? That, that's where they might get guilt, personal guilt. Nobody caught them sneaking candy, but they feel guilty in and, of, in and of themselves. The next one is from six till like puberty, and that's called industry versus inferiority. Now in Freud's psychosexual stages of development, this corresponds to that latency period. I think Freud missed in the latency period that really the libido, the energy goes to the brain. And this is where these kids really start taking in the world, but they also take in that other kids are taking in the world and they sort of sort themselves out in a little bit of a hierarchy of they're the smartest, they're the best athlete, they're the best looking, they're the most sociable, they're the funniest. This is where that begins to start happening and they wanna say, do I have efficacy in my own community groups to really become industrious and do something that uh, accomplish some goal I have or do I feel inferior towards those others around me? All right, so that's, that's basically the, the corresponding stages of 
what's going on with people right before Erickson sort of direct, um, goes into the older ages, which is above puberty, so like your late teens, early 20s. He calls that ego identity versus, infer uh, versus role confusion. This is like trying to figure out who you are. A lot of you are probably in that stage right now going, who am I? What am I doing? Where am I headed? What are my goals? What's the meaning of life? This is where your ego, yourself, your belief about yourself and what you should be doing have to come to, um, come to fruition. You gotta really try to figure out what roles uh, you're gonna be taking on, what goals you're gonna have for your life and how are you gonna implement them. As you move into sort of like, okay, I'm gonna go become a writer. Uh, you go, you move to New York City and you start trying to, you know, sell your, your writing to the Times or something. The next stage in young adulthood is called intimacy versus isolation. Intimacy versus isolation might be where some of you are now too, but I don't know your situation, but this is where you decide sort of, okay, I know who I am, I know what goals I'm pursuing, but who can help me with that or who can I help with their goals and how do I develop a relationship with them? How do I learn to commit to them? How do I self-sacrifice so that we can blend together? This is intimacy versus isolation. A lot of people, including yours truly, had some issues with uh, the isolation because look, if I am independent, if I can do things on my own, how do you submit to a relationship where you literally become lesser so that the relationship becomes more? It's difficult, but it's totally worthwhile. And Erickson saw that and described that at this stage, that's when meaningful, deep relationships are going to take hold. Then when you get to my old age, uh, you start to get into this thing called generativity versus stagnation. Okay, so I have a great job. I get to sit in my backyard and teach you guys, right? Uh, I got a family. Um, I love my, I'm committed to my wife. I'm never leaving. Beautiful little kids. Well, now what? So, so what am I supposed to do now? I feel fine, everything's good with me. Now, in this stage, Erickson says that you got this choice. Uh, uh, you can say, well, because I have it good, I'm just gonna keep it going. I'm just gonna free ride this out. Or what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look to be that helper. I'm gonna look to be that one that brings others up, that gives others opportunity, right? You've gone through that struggle. You now have the experience to sort of share that with people and, and really make a positive impact on your community. That's where people at my age, uh, up until like they're probably, you know, when they start qualifying for AARP, that's where we sort of get meaning in our older years is actually giving back, generativity, generate something, find somebody who needs that help, provide them with those means, assets, opportunities, knowledge, wisdom, support, encouragement, even criticism, or, or we can just do our own thing and stagnate, right? So that's sort of the mid 40s to, to your early uh, mid 60s. Then you get to the most interesting part for me, which is integrity versus despair. At the end of your life, when you look back, are you gonna say, uh, my wife's grandfather says something always, it almost makes me tear up. He, he had a wonderful life, lived to like 97 years old and he was just such a fun guy to get to know in his elderly years. He was somebody who clearly had integrity and was having so much fun. In fact, one of the last things he said to one of his sons was, it was all so much fun. You know, he looked back and had this perspective on his life of what a ride, you know? Uh, and that's different than other folks who get to the end of their train, uh, train ride in this life and they go, I'm mad about that. I'm upset. I could have done this. I could have been that. I, I should have been nicer to them. I, I should have given more to them. I should have spent more time with them. That is where we try to feel a sense of accomplishment and achievement and recognize that the hard work and sacrifice and commitments that we put in in our lives came to fruition and there is a beautiful, bountiful harvest of life. Or we look at the fallowed fields of our life and we go, oh, what could I have done? What could I have done? And then you have this depression or despair as Erickson called about uh, this feeling of it, it wasn't, I, I didn't do what I could. 
Uh, there's the parable of the talents in the New Testament of you were given a certain amount. What did you do with it over your period of time? So that's the last part of that. Next, we'll talk about puberty.